sanctification process that we can see things uh, more pure like do you see a, a person sin or do you see what they can be in Christ I just asked a question do you see the sin in people or do you see the person created in the image of God and I think that's so important because I guarantee you, everybody in this place has something that I don't like. <laughs> and you probably have something and see something in people you don't like. But if you dwell on that one thing, how many of you know it'll corrupt your mind and your conscience and your heart? I just said something now. I hope you catch it by the Spirit. So when you look at people, look at them as creations of God and and let me say this this is so important look at yourself as a new creation in God old things have passed away behold all things have become new and what are you looking at the old or the new I just said something catch it what are you looking at the old which has been done away at Calvary or the new which came forth when Christ was resurrected from the dead. How many of you know if you're born again, you're a new creation in God. And that's what we're to see in each other. Amen. Michelle, so glad to have you back. David, so good to have you back, son. And so good to see everybody this morning. And Michelle, come up and lead us in worship and praise. Twenty-three up on the board, please. King James is fine. When I was in Ohio, when I was uh, I was living in Spencer, Ohio, with my grandparents, and this is shortly after my mother had passed away years ago. They have a homestead, like a, on their home and their barns and all that for their farm on this little hill, and. Going down the hill, there was this valley, and it was so, like, the grass was beautiful. My grandfather took really good care of it, and there was a stream that ran through it. And I'll never forget, there was one time that, as a little girl, I was walking through this valley, and we were always told, you know, how when the street lights come on, you better hurry up and get home. Well, I had walked through this valley and was all the way on the other side, and the sun starts going down. And it just, to me, it just happened quickly because when you're in a valley, it gets dark fast. And it's shade trees and all this stuff. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And I was like trying to hurry up to get home. And I'll never forget the feeling I had while in this valley. Like it's dark, I'm alone, what's going on? And then when I got home, I told my grandmother, I'm so sorry I didn't get home fast enough. You know, and she said, well, it can be kind of scary. I want us to, to uh, look through this Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, thou I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And when I was young, it felt like death to me. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever. We have a future and a hope. So no matter what valley you're in right now, you have a future. You have a hope. When it's all said and done, we're going to be in heaven. It'll be over and done with. Amen? Let's stand to our feet and worship the Lord today. No matter what you're going through, he is your keeper in the valley. He is your protector. He is your deliverer. Amen. 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 You, go ahead. you are an awesome God, Lord. Thank you. We worship you today. 
somebody lift your hands as we celebrate the greatness of our God. Tell you you are awesome. The worship song that says this, our God is awesome. Our God is awesome. He can move mountains. He can move the mountains. Keep me in the valley. Keep me in the valley. Hide me from the rain. Hide me from the rain. Come on, our God is awesome. My God is My God is awesome. My God is awesome. He can move mountains. He can move mountains. Keep me in the valley. Keep me in the valley. Hide me from the rain. Hide me from the rain. My God is awesome. My God is awesome. He heals me when I'm broken. Heals me when I'm broken. Strength where I've been weak. Strength where I've been weak. Forever heal.
still belong Only you can see me For who I really am Yet you love me Oh, how you love me In my weakness You are strong my weakness, you are strong, and in my failures, I still belong, only you can see me, for who I really am, yet you love me.
pour out of ourselves, the more room we give God to come in. Amen. Thank you, Father. We surrender to you, Lord. Fill us up, Lord. We bless you. No matter what you're going through today, you got to know He's on your side. Turn this thing around. God, turn it around. We declare it. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. I'm calling on the name. Yes, you can change it, Lord. It changes everything. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. All of my hope is in the name, the name of Jesus. Breakthrough will come, come in the name, the name of Jesus. Pray God, turn the God turn it around, God turn it around, God turn it around. I'm calling on the name, yes we are Lord, the change is everything. God turn it around. Something. He is up to something. God is doing something right now. He is up to something. He is up to something. God is doing something right now. He is healing something. He is saving something. God is doing something right now. Right now. He is healing someone. He is saving someone. God is doing something right now. He is moving mountains, making a way for someone. God is doing something right now. He is moving mountains, making a way for someone. God is doing something right now. He is moving mountains, making a way for someone.
they say, God, you did all of this. Therefore, I can have faith for that. Unexpected awesome. kindness. I, I turn my, my face to you. To you. Trust you. Have your way, Father. You've done it before. Surrounded by your mercy, I'm falling into you.
Father, we thank you that sometimes that's what we just have to do. Yes. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord as we trust you. Amen. Yes, Lord. Trust you to bring it to pass, Lord. Yes. Thank you for this beautiful day, yes. for your loving kindness and your mercy, for the salvation that you have provided through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we thank you for all that you've blessed us this week. We thank you that all of our sins are forgiven, that we've been born again by the Spirit of the living God, and you are our Heavenly Father, and we are your children. And we thank you, Lord, that you're a good Father, and you know how to raise us up, and we thank you for that. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. So good to see everybody again this morning. Do we have any first-time visitors? Do we have one, one over here? God bless you, young lady. God bless you, young lady. Glad to have you. Do we have any last-time visitors? <laughs> Sometimes it works that way. Sometimes my preaching will run them off. I don't mean to do that. <laughs> That's just the way it works sometimes. Who's that beautiful lady back there sitting back on the wall back there? Who's that? That looks like my wife, Susan. Hey, darling. Hey. <laughs> How many gets up in the morning that takes you at least an hour before you can speak? <laughs> Mike back there. You don't got nobody to speak to in your house, do you? Oh. I tell Susan, just a minute, as soon as I find my face, darling, I'll, I'll tell you I love you. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I believe in laughter. Laughter is better than a medicine. i tell you what I'll do. I got a bottle of castor oil right here. Either laugh or I'll give you some of this. <laughs> How many would start laughing? Ha, 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 ha. Go ahead, I did. Ha, 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 ha. Ha, 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 ha. Ha, 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 ha. Man, we just need to give our face a lift and laugh sometimes. Laugh at the devil. Laugh. Laughter is better than a medicine, and we need to learn to do that. Just laugh. Praise God. So good to see everybody this morning. So good to see Michelle and, uh, and, uh, David back with us in South Carolina. They're going to have to go back to Texas. Um, Floyd's grandfather is not doing too well. He fell and broke his hip, and it's just one thing and after. That's why I have my cane. I don't want to fall again. I've, that falling is for the birds. <laughs> Even the birds don't like to fall. So you got to watch it. Watch where you step. Don't fall physically. And don't fall spiritually. So remember that. Keep a good attitude. Love yourself. What? Love yourself. Yeah, love yourself. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. And if you don't love yourself, you're not going to love your neighbor. So that's a lot of problems that people have. Because you've been created in the image of God. And if you're a child of God, you've been born again by the Spirit of the living God. Old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You're not what you used to be. You're a new creature in Christ. So always see yourself. The old creature, the old you died with Christ. 
on the cross 2,000 years ago. Isn't it something a man that lived 2,000 years ago has influenced your life today? Now think about that. One man that died on an old rugged cross, that's why you're here this morning. Think about that. 2,000 years almost have gone by. And we are here. Why are we here? Because we've been born again because we're children of God. And we worship our Heavenly Father in heaven. Our life has changed. It ain't what it used to be. God don't look at us old sinners anymore. He sees us as his children. Amen. 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 Good. I'm glad to hear that. How many of you know you'll be transformed by the renewing of your mind? I'm going to say that again. You will be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And if you're still thinking, stinking, thinking, you're going to stink. But if you stop that stinking thinking, Pastor Bob, I've never heard a preacher say that. I know. I'm a country boy. I can say it. I've been called by God to preach the gospel and to preach the truth. You're not what you used to be. You are a new creature in Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. <laughs> Be like King David. I speak what I believe. Right. Everybody say that. I speak, I speak. what I believe. Amen. And what do you believe? Yeah. I believe I'm a new creature in Christ. I believe I'm a new man, and I believe one day I'm going to have a new body, and I'm not going to walk with a cane, and I'm not going to run with a cane. In fact, I'll probably do a little flying. There's Brother Bob, just flew by. Hey, Brother Bob. Oh, you think I'm crazy? I am. I'm crazy about Jesus, and I'm crazy about the body of Christ. It doesn't matter too much what people think anymore about me. It's what God thinks. That's what counts. At the end of the line is what God thinks. Remember that. Praise God. Well, I don't forgot where I'm at now. Let's see, I'm at church, right? Okay. <laughs> All right, we're going to have a song. Naomi, where are you at? There you are. Naomi's going to sing. We're going to take up our tithes and offerings to the Lord. So, Naomi, give the Lord a hand to, to Naomi. And we can bring our tithes and offerings to the Lord. Good morning, Good morning, brothers and sisters. I had another song, but I just felt led that this somebody needs to hear this. And I was it, recalling a time whenever I was... Uh, learning and growing and and which I still am and uh, you know it's real easy to praise God when everything is we used to say hunkadory but uh when everything is fine and dandy it's real easy but it's when things come and I kind of visualize that um, the enemy sent something into my home to try to, I was just showing for too much joy and peace. I had joy and peace in, in my house. And he, he just sent his cohorts and his, uh, in there to try to stir up. And he said, now there's just too much joy and peace going on in there. You, we're going to have to do something to uh, break that up. Uh, and so I knew that I was in a teaching and it said that you're supposed to praise him in all things. And I thought, well, you know what, Lord, I just got to be just plumb honest with you right now. I just don't think I can muster up a praise. But I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to do it. As an act of my own will, I had to reach way down into my soulish realm where, where your mind and your will and your emotions are. And I said, well, I'm just going to praise you. And it was kind of lousy at first, to tell you the truth. I said, okay, then praise the Lord. All right, praise you, Lord, praise you, Lord. And I began to keep praising. And after a while, it became real. 
and alive inside of me. And I just kept praising him and praising him and, and praising him. And you know, that does say uh, they would send the praise leaders first when you were in battle. And so you got to lay that out. And so I'm, I'm just thankful to the Lord that he allows me to hear truth and that I can go ahead and do what, what uh, he wants me to do in times when Naomi don't feel like it. And I feel like I didn't even have it in me. And, and as I went ahead and did it, then it was a really true praise because he deserves it. And when we do that, we just humiliate the Satan right there in front of his, his demons and his courts. He just gets humiliated when we do that. So we just need to, go, no matter what's happening, right? We need to praise God through it all, whatever is the situation is. It's three, four. Three, four. Life is easy when we're up on a mountain and you've got peace of mind like you've never known. But things change and you're down in a valley. Don't lose faith for you're never alone for the god on the mountain is still god in the valley when things go wrong he'll make them right and the god of the good times he's still god in the bad times God of the day is still God in the night. Think of faith when you're up on a mountain. Talk comes easy when life's at its best. But it's down in the valley trials and temptations that's where faith is really put to the test for the god on the mountain he's still god in the valley when things go wrong he'll make them right and the God of the good times, he's still God in the bad times. God of the day is still God in the night. God of the day is still God in the night. We need to remember that. He's God on the mountain, the top of the mountain. He's God in the lowest part, but he's God all in between. Now, let me just say this, and I'm going to turn it over to Michelle to bring the word. And um, I like everything to go smooth 24-7. How many go along with that? But how many of you know that ain't the way it goes sometimes? <laughs> You're going to have valley experiences. But you'll meet God there too. 
unless you just have some self-pity party and just go off in the crack somewhere and hide. Everything ain't going to be rosy all the time. <laughs> but Lord, I want it always to be rosy. But it ain't that way in this life. That's the next life. In this world, you will have tribulation, Jesus said. But cheer up. I have overcome the world. Hallelujah. So remember that. Yeah, I remember when, uh, when I was young and I thought, <clears throat> they're talking about the Lord coming. I said, no, don't come till I get married. How many of you ever thought like that? You want to get married first. Didn't know what we're talking about, did we? But, <laughs> but God is God. And let God be God. And if you got any co concerns or anything, let it go. Let it go. Let it go. G-O. Go. Quit holding on to it. That ain't all of your life. We're going to have dinner today, right? Someone said, what are we going to have? We're going to have oatmeal and grits. Oatmeal and grits. Susan tells me in the morning, honey, do you want oatmeal or grits for breakfast? I said, I don't want either one, Ma. I want two eggs, grits and coffee, and two pieces of toast. She says, it's coming up, baby. It's coming up. I, I can't hardly wait. So if you're sad this morning, just get glad. Come on, just get glad. Yeah. Get glad. Not sad, but glad. Because God is the God of the mountain, and he's God of the valley. He's God all in between. So cheer up. God loves you. You're a child of God. You're not going to hell. You're going to heaven. You're not going to always live in that body you live in right now. Don't worry about those wrinkles. They'll go away one day when God gives you a new body. I ain't worried about the hair on my head. Because I ain't got none. And that's okay. Because God counts those things that be not. So I count those things that be not. You like my hair up there? I know I got my hair somewhere down there. I'm trying to cheer you up. It's okay. You're going to make it, okay? You're going to make it. How can you talk like that, Bob? Listen, I just didn't come up yesterday. I'm 90 years old. I've been through every experience I think you can experience in life. And I'm still alive, and I'm still saved, and I'm still full of the Holy Ghost. I ain't mad at nobody, and I'm not even mad at myself anymore. Woo! Woo! Boy, that's a giant step in it. Not even mad at my own self anymore. Chip, chip, old boy. Cheer up. Things will get worse. Sure enough, they got worse. But they're going to get better. Amen. Not bitter. Don't get bitter in life. Get better. Amen. I want to say that again. Don't get bitter. Get better. Amen. I'm not talking about butter. I said better. Not bitter, not butter, but better. Amen. Well, that's my sermon for the day. Michelle, see if you can get me out of this. <laughs> God bless everybody. God bless you, Michelle. Are you sure? Because I can hand it to you. If you... Okay. okay. All right. Everybody doing all right today? Yes. You happy to be in the house? 
I'm happy you're here too, because I'd preach to one of you if there was only one here. Can you put uh, Psalms 92, verse 13 on the board? It's not in my notes that you guys have up there. You know, I am not used to standing here. I am going to have to come down here. Sorry. David, would you do me a huge favor, honey? Can you get the black uh, podium from inside the men's classroom, please? I'd like for you guys to read this here. Planted in the house of the Lord... They will flourish in the courts of our God. You are planted in the kingdom of God for such a time as this. And guess what that means? You're going to flourish. Because you didn't plant yourself. God planted you where you are strategically for such a time as this. Amen. Let's go and open up in prayer. Father, we just thank you for this time. Father, we thank you for planting us where we are strategically in this world, in this planet, for such a time as this. And Father, we just open our hearts to you right now, Father. And we just want to say thank you. Thank you for where you put me. Thank you. Thank you for those neighbors you put me next to. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the weather that you've allowed me to enjoy in South Carolina. Thank you, Father, for all the things that you had in mind when you planted us where we are. And Father, help us not to miss the reasons that we're planted where we are. Father, you have called us to flourish where we're planted. And we just receive that nourishment from you, Father. You are our strength. And we thank you for your life, for your anointing on our lives, and for just, not just helping us, but being our strength. Being what we need. Because without you, there is no way that we could live in this planet and flourish. We thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Wow. So, before I tell you what the heading of this teaching is today, I am going to ask a couple of questions. So we have participation going on here, folks. All right? I'm not going to call you out and, and embarrass you or anything. At least I'll try not to. Yeah, my friend laughs because she knows me well. Um, You've heard Jesus say that we're supposed to be fishers of men, right? Okay. Well, I actually did the teaching on that once, how to be a fisherman. There's all kinds of fishing. Granddaddy would always take us out on the river when it was dark outside, and he would take us on the boat at night, good times, with a flashlight and he would take this really thick line and set bush hooks with a big chunk of meat on it right up next to the bank. So of course the kids, me being young, I get to hold the flashlight while he's putting his hands in areas where there might be snakes and all kinds of other craziness. He sets the bush hooks, we go back home, get a few hours of sleep, and then we come back to find the bottom feeders attached to the hook catfish, you know, just great fishing. You could take a rod and reel and throw it out there and catch the top feeders. Go get yourself a bass. I'll never forget my brother and I went bass fishing for my very first time. He took me out in the boat. He was around 11-ish. I was 13, 12. Yeah, we were out there by ourselves because grandpa and grandma taught us how to use the boat and the motor and the whole nine. So we go out there and I throw into this area. We were in Graveyard Creek on Cape Fear, the Cape Fear River. Never forget it. And as I'm casting it, my brother says, what are you casting over there for? I was like, I don't know. I've never been bass fishing before. I've only gone for brim and, you know, I don't know. He said, you're not going to catch anything over there. 
about the time the fly hit the water, I was setting the hook. I caught myself a three pound bass the first time I cast out. He was like, oh, I can't believe it. I've been fishing this river. I've never blah, blah, blah. It was crazy, but it was fun. Being a fisherman, we are called to be fishers of men. There are people out there who are bottom feeders. I mean, they are bottom feeders. They like, to, they like it at night, they, you know, whether it's prostitution or drugs, alcohol, the whole nine yards, they love it. But it takes a real strong line of communication and a big hunk of meat to reel them in. And you better make sure that that line of communication stays with them or you might lose them. There was a thing I saw on Facebook, I think it was yesterday, day before yesterday. I mean, a lot of you have already heard this where they'll take a mouse or a rat and they'll put it in a cage and they give them water that's just regular water and then they'll give them water that's spiked with uh, Coke, not Coca-Cola. We're talking snorty Coke. I call it snorty Coke. And that rat will go and drink that coke can get addicted and even kill itself. It'll overdose really easily. But if you put a family of rats, multiples, in a cage with the same two water bottles, they will not drink out of the cocaine. They don't like it. They'll drink out of the regular water, but they will not become addicted. They either don't kill themselves with it. Interesting, the behaviors. A lot of times we want to push away from people we don't understand. We don't want to be around them. You know, if you see a gothic person walking down the street, you might want to walk on the other side and maybe, you know, woohoo, they're so dark, who knows what I might get myself into if I get too close. But God doesn't want us to stay away from the world in that sense. He wants us to reach them. And we have been planted where we are for such a time as this, to flourish. How are we flourishing? Are our treasures here? No, we're, we're building our treasures up in heaven, folks. If we're, I mean, God has got a plan. And the name of this teaching is, we are all farmers with the Lord. I know I started off with fishers of men, but I'm going somewhere. All right, I'm here to let you know that scripture is very clear that we are farmers as well in the spirit, in the spirit we are. 1 Corinthians 3, 9, for we, that's us, are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. Now look at this for a second. That word husbandry, do you know what that word is? I mean, we look at it and say, oh, husband, we're together, united with God, but that's not the meaning of that word. The meaning of that word is farmer. The original root word is farmer. And you read some other translations. In the Amplified, it says, we are God's fellow workers, his servants, working together. You are God's cultivated field, his garden, his vineyard. If we are working together with him and he's farming the land, guess what? We are too. Follow me with this, guys. In order to know that you're doing a good job as a fellow farmer, we have to understand farming a little bit, right? Some of you in here have plowed with mules. Some of you in here have planted gardens in your yard had, you know, different areas, maybe put a couple of tomato plants in and just kind of tended to it. In the spirit realm, we are called to cultivate. We are called as farmers. So let's look at farmers in the natural. Remember, it's natural first, then it's spiritual. We have to understand it, just like I explained the whole fishing thing. You got to understand what a fisherman is to know what your job is as a fisher of men. Well, it's the same thing with being a farmer. We need to understand farming as a farmer, 
to understand what our job is in the spirit realm. So first thing I always do is I look at the word. What is a farm? What does it mean? And at first I thought a farm is only like food, but it has to do with animals and livestock too. It's not just food. You can be a llama farmer. I don't know if I want those spit in my face every two seconds, so probably not. But yeah, you can raise goats, cows, all of them, whatever, and have a garden and crops. The word farm is basically an area of land and its buildings used for growing crops and rearing animals, typically under the control of one owner or manager. Did you know when Adam was created in the Garden of Eden, he was given that responsibility? The very first man on earth in the beginning was a farmer. To farm is to make one's living by growing crops or keeping livestock. So what kind of farmer do you want to be? You know they even have fish farms. I mean, think about that. It's kind of crazy because you can drop a line in a fish farm and catch it every time. <laughs> Don't ask me how I know that. So when you think of a farmer, just ponder it for a moment. And this is where I won't call on you to embarrass you. If you're thinking about a farmer, what do you think about when you picture a farmer? Anybody? Pigs. Pigs. Slops, slopping the hogs is what we called it. Pigs. Think of farmers. What do you think about? It could be anything. You don't. Chicken. Seeds, chickens. I got four of those. Pardon? Dirt. Tomatoes. Under the nails, too. Tomatoes. Tomatoes. Butter beans. He's ready to leave. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, lunch? <laughs> Having faith in God for those things to grow. I mean, there's a lot of prayer that goes into it. I'm going to show you this real quick. How many of you guys know what a farmer's almanac is? Let me read this. Does it have it on the top page? No, I thought it did. There are some things in this I don't like, I don't agree with, but... For the most part, yeah, the astronomy, the, the, uh, all that. But there's faith in here. There's prayers in here. There's people, the Farmer's Almanac is a guide for f farmers to know when is the best time based on the moon, based on you know the weather and that, to plant their seeds, to have their crops, that kind of a thing. We have a God that knows it all. He knows that your neighbor is not saved. He knows that seeds have been planted, but they need a little water. He knows everything about the ground of people that are around you. And all it takes is a whisper from God to know what that person needs for them to grow and flourish where they've been planted. Missy's got a neighbor that she's been ministering to for years. We've got her on the prayer list. We keep praying, and I believe the day is coming when she's going to walk in this church. And it's like I can see her walking through that door. I don't see her walking through that door. I see her walking through that door. I, have see, I know that I know that I know that God has heard her prayers, has heard our prayers, and that woman's going to walk through this door. And it's more than that, too. It's, I believe she's going to give her heart to the Lord because of the love that God has shown through this body towards her. Amen? Yeah, I believe it. I, I honestly, I really believe it. So what do farmers do? I mean, preparation is key. If you don't prepare and you plant the same crop in the same spot, year after year after year. guess what that crop's not going to come back year after year it's draining every nutrient out of the soil that it needs to grow you have to 
alternate the crop in that spot with other crops so that the soil can have what it needs for those other crops. There's so much involved in farming and some people are like, well, I almost came in here in overalls and boots, guys, but I decided I wasn't going to do that because I don't want to lead worship in overalls and boots. But had I only been teaching, you would have seen me in my overalls. The word that God gave me about this farmer mentality that we need to have is that we are in a season right now of the spiritual harvest. I'm telling you folks, the fields are white and ripe and ready for harvest, but the farmers have to do something to get the harvest in. It is our job to look and be very careful. Hmm, is this tomato ready to pick? If I pick it now, it may never turn red. It may stay green and just die green. Well, I like fried green tomatoes, but that's beside the point. We have to know what the Holy Spirit is speaking to us about, folks. So in order to do that, we have to stay in close relationship with him. And I am preaching to the choir here. You guys know this stuff. But the harvest is ready. Ecclesiastes 3.1 says, There is a season, a time appointed for everything, a time for every delight and event and purpose under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to uproot what has been planted. There are folks that are in our lives right now, some things that have been planted in their life by their parents, their siblings, need to be uprooted. If we took the time, T-I-M-E is a farmer's best friend, other than the Lord. Time. It, you can't just plant a seed and go poof. I have a cucumber. It doesn't happen that fast. Time. If we spend time with folks and let them share what is going on in their lives. And see, in the world we're in right now, it's all about quick fix, microwave it, scroll it. Admit, that was nice. You remember what you saw this morning on Facebook or on Instagram? Probably not. We're in such a hurry all the time, but if we take the time, my counselor shakes her head, yes. If we take the time to listen and really internally be asking the Lord, Father, what does this person need right now? We know they need you, but what do they need? Do they need a word of encouragement? Do they need deliverance? Do they need, what do they need? And God is faithful. His sheep know his voice, and a voice of another they will not follow. If we listen, he will speak. It might be the still small voice, but that's how we learn to hear from him and speak to people and birth things in folks' lives. So that scripture about the harvest is ready, but the workers are few is found in Matthew 9, verse 36. When he saw the crowds, when he saw the crowds, he was moved with compassion on them. How many times do we go into the grocery store and we have one or two things we need to get and we get in and we get out because we don't want a COVID or we don't want to talk to somebody or maybe my hair is not fixed that day or whatever, we want to get in and get out, and we're not as aware of what the Lord wants us to do while we're there. I am not bringing condemnation on you by saying, well, we need to do this, and we need... No, I want to encourage you. Listen to the Holy Spirit. I hear... When I'm out there serving legal documents, because I'm doing that now in the evenings, which is kind of crazy. I was telling Pastor Bob, when Floyd's not here, when he's caring for his dad... He has no income for our family. We're, I'm having to work my full-time job and work the evening process service job in order to maintain our finances. Now, when I'm out there, I can work my job from wherever I am 
and Floyd, when he's here, he can work his jobs, no problem. There was a point to that. Don't you love age? I never thought that would ever happen to me, Pastor Bob. Lord have mercy. Compassion on people, no matter where you are. Grocery store. It's taking that breath. Okay, Lord, you're walking with me everywhere I go. I'm not going to forget that you're walking with me. And that's the thing I think a lot of times we forget. And it's not that we, oh, I forgot you, God. But it's not being as aware of him being with you, walking before you, beside you, behind you, living in you, but knowing what he wants you to do when you walk in. He was moved with compassion because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. He didn't say the Christians were few, because they've got a lot of Christians, I'm sure. But the laborers are few. Does that mean you need to work yourself to death? No. It's listening and responding, listening and responding, letting the Holy Spirit guide us through it. His compassion. When is the last time we saw someone in need or in hurt and we had compassion, true compassion for them? You know, growing up, and this is something I've learned about myself, I'm going to share all my laundry now, um, is when I was raised by my father, I was always looking for his approval. My mother was very sick at the time she had Marfan syndrome, and yes, she was in my life, but she passed away when I was eight years old. And so when someone would share with me, oh, guess what, my friend Brenda, I'll use her as an example, she'll say, my mom and I, we went shopping and we found these amazing strawberries at the grocery store. In me, I want to be a part of the conversation. So I would say, oh, I remember these strawberries that my grandmother gave us like 50 years ago, and they were amazing. You know, why would I, you know, I'm coming up with the same bouncing off of a conversation because I want to be involved because I felt like I was not involved with my father during the time of my mother's death because he was focused on her. He was focused on serving her, and so that was a gap in my heart. So there's things that you learn about yourself as you plant seeds in other people's lives, as you start ministering and having compassion and just listening. And it's not like I was trying to one-up or, yeah, my strawberries are bigger than your strawberries. It wasn't like that at all. But it's that feeling of, of, of someone hearing and receiving and communicating with you. So we need to have a heart of a farmer that's compassionate. A farmer will walk up to a plant that's got one branch that's green and beautiful and the other one that's dead, and you know his compassion will clip that dead leaf off or that dead branch off. Remember the scriptures about I am the vine and you are the branches if you're not producing fruit because it will suck the life out of the rest. Matthew 18, verse 11. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. Verse 12. Goes into the mountains and seeketh that which has gone astray. Verse 13. And if so, be that that he find it, Verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Farmer, one of his sheep, 
just takes off. He has compassion for that sheep. Does it mean he doesn't have compassion for the other 99 he just left? No. But the compassion that that sheep could get damaged or hurt or lost is there. So as a farmer, we are to have compassion. Compassion. What is compassion? Where you can actually feel what they're going through. You take the time to embrace what they're going through and help them through it. So let's be great farmers, right? Farmers are protectors. They know the dangers of the outdoors and they know how to prevent accidents from happening and animals from getting eaten by other animals. Oh my goodness. My, you know, I've got chickens, so I had seven to start with. Um, a friend of mine that used to um, have them downtown um, was going to do an addition on their home and so they needed the chickens gone because they needed that room. So I brought the chickens in and at one point, <clears throat> I think it was the last year I was, uh, I was taking care of dad in Texas and Floyd calls me and he says, Michelle, I'm really sorry. And I said, what, what happened? Well, your chickens, I went, oh no, what happened? He said, a dog, it was a husky, a big husky dog had come into the yard, just wandering around, heard the chickens. And I've got a, a like a 20 by 15-ish run that they run in and then there's a coop for them for their nesting. This dog literally chewed through the wood, gar, like Cujo, <laughs> you know, ripped the chicken out of the coop. She was in there trying to have an egg, I guess, and ripped and just put him in the yard and came back for more. And Floyd heard this ruckus and he came in, you know, came outside and he, he yelled at the dog. He said, what are you doing? And the dog just cowered down like, oh, I'm sorry, I did something wrong. And he took the dog and he put him inside of his van and shut the door and then tended to the chickens so they all wouldn't get out. And, you know, you would not think that he would chew through the actual wood. I mean, most animals would burrow underneath and try to get in some other way, but he chewed through the wood. I mean, it's splintered all. I got pictures. It was crazy. Farmers know how to protect their flock or their, the, the, those that they're in the care of. Your neighbors are in your care. Well, apparently I didn't take very good care of mine. I'm sorry, but you know, <laughs> my chickens. I didn't know. I mean, who would have known, right? So you're going to have situations that will happen, and you're like, ooh, how did that happen? But your neighbors, your friends, your church family, people that you see in the grocery store, all these people are a part of your care. They've been put in front of you for a reason. Don't forget that. Every person you see when you walk out of the store today, that is an opportunity for you to minister to them. Even if it's a smile or God loves you, something simple, God will minister to them. You know, Farmers have to know what plants have to be in shade, what plants can be in the sun, what plants need more nitrates than others. They need to know how deep the seeds need to be planted because if you jam the seed in a little bit too hard, a little bit too far, it's not going to come out. Sometimes it just needs to be right on the surface. You need to know about fertilizer, which fertilizer is going to make the tree grow or the plant grow, what food is going to allow your, your uh, animals to grow. I learned something new this year I had no idea cows. I had no idea that drought would cause the nitrates in the hay that they eat to get too high that if they eat it, they would die. Had no idea. I mean, I would have had cows. I'd been like, yeah, go eat your hay. You know, it's okay. But no, if there's a drought, that hay gets so much nitrate in it that they have to literally harvest the hay and there are people in a lot of these communities that will take the hay and they will grind it up and mix it with other things, corn, barley, all kinds of things to get it to the point that they can eat it and they can use it and it's not a total waste. I had no idea. These are things that you don't want to learn, you know, on your own. You want to be taught those things. You don't want to have a bunch of cows dying on you. A farmer also needs to know how to pick the best fruit, which we talked about, how to keep the varmints away. 
Everybody say varmint. Varmint. Varmints. Knowing what plants will keep pests away. Sometimes you don't need sprays. Sometimes you just need a few marigolds or maybe some chrysanthemums. They'll keep these, you know, bugs coming in and taking over your plants. Mint will help keep spiders and ants and mosquitoes away too. So I was raised on a farm, if you didn't know, in Ohio, in the Medina area. Actually, it was in Spencer, Ohio. We've got so many great memories. Horseback riding, I mean, walking through the woods and having to cross over the ravine or on a limb or a tree that had fallen over the top, so you have to walk across it. And then my grandfather would take us into the woods, and there was this old, uh, what he called the Indian house that had fallen or burned down. It had just the, uh, the fireplace was left and there was this junk pile where we could find those transformers from the electrical poles and all were all in that junk pile. So we would grab a few and take them to my grandmother. She loved that. There was, uh, we had an outhouse. It was a double seater <laughs> for anyone who cares. That was fun. Um, when I, I did something crazy. I actually climbed on top of that thing and um, went into the tree that was right next to it on one of the limbs, and then I couldn't get down. And I remember screaming, help! And my aunt came out, and she was like, what did you do? Why, how did you get up there? I said, I want to climb the, the outhouse. And so anyway, I had to jump, and she had to catch me, so that was great. Another time, I thought I was being really smart. I took these baby kittens whose eyes had not even opened, thank God, at that point, and I was going to give them a bath. And this is when the, the outhouse was just starting, like they just get it, got it built. And so I put these baby cats in the hole, and then I took this jug that I thought was water and just started pouring it on them from the top because I thought it was kind of cool. Come to find out it was kerosene. All of them lived, thank God. They were, uh, the eyes, like I said, the eyes had not been opened. They didn't drown in it or anything. But we did have to wash them. Just, you know, things you learn when you're on a farm that kids today just know nothing about. Hmm. There was, uh, we had Teddy, big Chinese chow. Dog was like massive. This is the kind of dog that has all the hair, like so thick, thick, thick hair, like he was always shedding. That's the one thing I remember about Teddy. But my cousin Jenny, who's like a sister to me, she was about four years old, three or four, and my Aunt Jean was cooking, and my Uncle Dave was out mowing the lawn, and he was given the responsibility to keep an eye on her in the yard. We have two ponds, actually we had three, just to make sure she was safe. Well, Jean comes outside and can't find Jenny. And Uncle Dave doesn't know where she is either. So, my gosh, we're all freaking out. Where is she at? She goes to one pond, doesn't see her. Then she looks across the way at the other pond where the cattails were, and they're moving. And her heart stops. She goes over there, and she hears Jenny saying, Move! And I'm like, what? Move! She, Teddy had gotten in front of her. She was going to that water. She had walked out to that water, and he got in front of her, and she had a hold of his back, shaking him, screaming, move, and he wouldn't move. God sent that dog to save her life. You know, she's a minister now up in North Carolina. Her and her husband are getting ready to start a satellite church for 828 Church in Wilmington. It's just like amazing what God has done in their lives. But there are things you can learn as a farmer on a farm. Remember that in the spiritual realm. When you're ministering to people, we're not always going to get it right. We're going to mess up. We're going to guess wrong, know wrong, whatever. Just be gracious with it. Be humble. Well, I thought I was right. You know, well, put all that pride aside. It's just a waste of time. It is the season to start reaping a harvest. It's not time to hide like we did during COVID. It's time to get out and minister and have the heart of compassion for folks. Let's look at Matthew 6. 
Two more scriptures, this one and one more. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break in nor steal. Break through. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So where is our treasure? Our treasure is whatever we're focused on. So we can stop and say, Lord, what am I focused on right now? What is it that's intimidating me, that's causing me fear to keep me from interacting with people? Or what's, what's holding me back? And just take a moment to think about that. Where is my treasure? What do I think about? You know, what comes out of your mouth is what's in your heart. So for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Hmm. This weekend, a little stressful for me, but really amazing at the same time. Imagine that. Um, they had the Abide Conference at uh, Faith Assembly up in Somerville. Amazing. I can't even tell you how amazing it was. It was just absolutely amazing. And Friday night, I forced myself to go, knowing I had papers to serve, knowing I had all these other distractions. My house, I'd been gone for two months. It had not been cleaned in two months, God knows. And I had things to do, because I had time off and I was gonna handle it, because I don't serve papers on Friday. People are drunk by the time you get there anyway. <laughs> so I forced myself to go, it was amazing. I just, again, I can't say it enough. Holy Spirit was there. My friend Amber turns and looks at me and she said, you're coming tomorrow, aren't you? And actually, no, my mom, my mom asked her, asked Amber what time she was picking my mom up because I had already decided I wasn't gonna go on Saturday morning. And Amber didn't answer, she just looked at me. Because she already knew I was supposed to be there Saturday, but she wasn't going to go there. You know, well, Michelle, you need to go. So she didn't want to harass me too much because she knew it was on my plate. But the whole time, my treasure, my heart was like, oh, I got to do this and I got to do that. I gotta, you know, I was, I was Martha all day long. But in that moment when she did not respond to her question, it all left like oh wow I can go because you know what I can just go I mean that's a novel idea I can go because I can go if my house is sitting there not clean oh well but you know what the panic was is Jonathan has a friend coming to visit and of course I wanted everything to be perfect for her and she's a sweetheart and but we have to realize that when we put things and the stress and all that above what we're called to do we aren't staying where God planted us and flourishing where God planted us we're going off somewhere else in our head and y'all know me well I mean, I go with my head way too much. Pastor Bob's always like, hey, in Jesus' name, we're coming against that stuff, you know. <laughs> but God is so good. Just be. Enjoy being a farmer and a fisher of men. Learn those things while we're going through. We're not going to store up where rust and moth destroy. I mean, granddaddy, when we'd get the potatoes out of the ground, We'd knock off some of the dirt, and he had these corrugated metal sheets that were underneath the crawl space under the house. And guess who got to crawl under the house with Granddad and put those potatoes on those metal pieces? Because it was cool under the house, and the potatoes would last forever on those metal things. And every so often, Grandma would say, hey, here's the pan. Go get me some potatoes. And we'd have to move the slot and crawl under the house, go over to where the potatoes were. If we found any rotten ones, we'd have to throw them out. 
to keep it from spoiling the rest. And then we would gather what she needed so she could cook that night. So where is our heart? Is our heart for the lost, like Jesus? Do we think about those who aren't saved, that live near us or are in our vicinity? Do we have compassion for them? Second Chronicles 16, 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro. When I read that, I thought, he's not just doing like this. Slow. He's, he's looking throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart, here we are again, heart again, is perfect towards him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. That word perfect doesn't mean I've arrived. Whose heart is peaceable and friendly. That is the root meaning of that word perfect. Peaceable, approachable. Just be approachable. Have compassion for people. Be approachable. I mean, Pastor Bob, when we've, got, we've gone out to, to eat like at, at the OK Corral, people just, oh, and Susan, I mean, they're passing out tracks. Hey, how's your day going? Wonderful. Shake their hand. Here's a track. Read it when you can. They're approachable. They're peaceable. I have not seen one person in the times that we've been in there say, oh, I ain't taking that. I've never seen them do that. Now, I'm sure they have throughout life at some point, but be peaceable, approachable, and you will be able to plant seeds. What is that? If you want to have friends, make yourself friendly. I have a story. In closing, I have this story, and I read it, and it's just a little bit not totally to do with everything I just taught, but it was kind of funny. A pastor asked an old farmer who was decked out in his bib overalls to say grace for the morning breakfast. Lord, I hate buttermilk, the farmer began. The pastor opened one eye to glance at the farmer, wondering where this was going. The farmer loudly proclaimed, Lord, I hate lard. Now the pastor was growing concerned. But without missing a beat, the farmer continued, And Lord, you know I don't care for raw white flour. The pastor once again opened an eye to glance around the room and saw that he wasn't the only one feeling uncomfortable. Then the farmer added, But Lord, when you mix them all together and you bake them, I sure do love warm, fresh biscuits. So Lord... When things come up that we don't like, when life gets hard, when we don't understand what you're saying to us, help us to just relax and wait until you're done mixing. Amen. And it will probably be even better than biscuits. Right. Amen. Amen. So no matter... No matter who God has called you to be planted near, no matter who you see in the store or where you're going about to and fro, just know that God's eyes are looking for you. He's looking, looking for that person he can show himself strong through. And then you look and you'll start getting in tune with the compassion of the Lord. You'll say, oh, the Lord because you'll feel it inside of yourself. The Lord is having compassion on this person. Just walk up to him. Don't be afraid. Or like, like Joyce Meyer say, do it afraid, even if you are afraid. And just say, hey, how are you today? Smile. Oh, I'm having a hard day. Well, that's a, your open door. You know, just start the conversation. God will open the doors and will allow it to happen. Let's go back to that scripture. Psalms 92.13. Sorry, I said there were two more, but I feel like I need to go back to this one again. First of all, is there anybody in here who does not have a Bible that would like one? Do you need a love Bible? 
Everybody have a love Bible. Now, this is a fun one to read. This one is amazing. If you need one, we have some others, too. Just like, I mean, that was really easy reading. It's, I was told growing up in the Lord that you have your study time, but as a teacher, you want to study all the time. <laughs> it's not good you should read just to read as well just to get it in your spirit and that is a very good bible to do that with those that are planted in the house of the lord shall flourish in the courts of our god are you planted in the court are you planted in the house of the lord i have one yes hmm. i hope i see more of you up there <laughs> You are planted in the house of the Lord. I'm going to tell you, you are planted in the house of the Lord. And you will flourish in the courts of our God. I do have a couple of these bands. It says flourish, and it's got that scripture on it. If you'd like them, I'm going to leave them right here on this. And if you need more, I've got a whole stack of them at home. And um, also, survival gardening, anyone? Vertical Research Library. We've got four copies of those up here as well if you'd like one. If you get up here and they're all gone, let me know and I'll be happy to get you another one. Father, we just thank you for your word, Father. We thank you that you have taught us in your word that we, we can be many things. We can be a fisherman. We can be a farmer. But Lord, you are the one who gives the increase. You are the one that stirs our heart to reach out to lost souls. And Father, I pray that we will be open to hear from you, Father. Be willing and aware of your presence everywhere we go, Father. And we love you, Lord, and we thank you for where you've strategically planted us. Help us, Lord, to minister to those folks that you have on your heart, Father, with compassion. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, sharing Christ with people, <clears throat> what a blessing that is. Susan will go into the supermarket and, she, and she'll probably pass out, sometimes she'll pass out 25 or 30 or more of these little booklets. Well, that's, you see, there is no crop without the sowing of the seed. Right. Now, I want to say that again. <clears throat> Maybe you are just a sower, but you're not a harvester. Well, I'm a harvester. And uh, I don't mind looking at you square in the face and saying, have you ever accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Well, I've heard about him. Yeah, that's good. That's a start. But have you ever received him as your personal Savior? This is what the Bible says. If thy will confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, Thy shall be saved. That's just that simple. You can't save nobody. I can't save nobody. The Holy Spirit is the one that does the saving. But our job is to share the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. So you're just going to have to come to that place to quit being fearful and uh, Susan, would you come here for a moment? Don't run, just walk, darling. <laughs> we're we're sort of <laughs> straight down this way, darling. <laughs> we're past that running thing, you know. We're past that running thing. All right. Oh, uh, uh, just come. Back. I'm going to use her as a guinea pig, okay? So this is what you need to do around your house, husbands and wives. Susie, you know, I read the scriptures the other day, and I have found something that we need to be saved. Now, you just play like right now you're not saved, okay? And this is, I've been reading the scriptures, and I've been going to church, and I've been hearing the preachers say that if someone will confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and believe in their heart that God has raised them from the dead, can be saved. 
Would you like to be saved? Yes. Well, would you repeat this after me? Yes. Dear Lord. Dear Lord. I believe. I believe. In my heart. In my heart. That Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ. Is the Son of God. Is the Son of God. And he died for me. And he died for me. And I thank you now. And I thank you now. I believe. I believe. In him. In him. And what he did. And what he did. At Calvary. At Calvary. And the Bible, you really believe that? With all my heart. Then you're saved. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You don't have to climb 20 mountains. You don't have to quote 35,000 scriptures. Praise God. If thy will confess, it's as close to you as your mouth. Amen. Point to your mouth. That's how close it is. Salvation is that close to every individual. And I'm going to say to you as your pastor who I love you so much, if you've never received Christ as your personal Savior, just come down to aisle right now. Just come down to aisle right now. Just get out of that chair. And don't let the devil hold you in that chair now. Just get up and come right down here. That everybody must be saved. Amen. Praise God. That's what we want to make sure. And you know, it's good. Susan, I want to confess something before you, honey. I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, and I've accepted him as my Lord and Savior. And if I pass away, I ain't going to die. I'm just going to pass away. And, and I, I sort of feel you're going to be right behind me. See, some people, you know, some people don't know how to understand. Listen, this ain't, this ain't our whole life down here. We're just pilgrims. We're just passing through. Don't you understand that? <laughs> now, you think I look good here, baby. You wait till I get my new resurrected body. Praise God. <laughs> Folks, it's a glorious salvation. It's a wonderful salvation. We're not a bunch of party poopers. We are the living children of God. We've been born again by the spirit of the living God. We have confessed with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and we believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead. Therefore, we will be raised. Hallelujah. Now, if somebody don't want to accept that, I'll love you and I'll pray for you until you disappear. But you're missing a good thing. I ain't talking about religion. I'm talking about a personal experience with the living God. Woo! Thank you, darling. I appreciate you coming up here. Can I pray the prayer that Paul prayed over the Christians at Ephesus? You think we ought to let her do that? If you want her to pray that prayer, raise your hand. Good. All right. When I think of the wisdom and the scope of God's plan, I bow my knees before the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whom the whole family in heaven and earth derives its name. And I thank God Christ dwells in our heart by faith. We are rooted and grounded in his love. And we know the length, the breadth, the height, the depth of his love. And to know the love of Christ, which passes all knowledge, that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask, think, hope for, or desire, according to the power that worketh in us. Now unto him be all the glory, all the honor, all the praise throughout the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 God bless you. Have a good week. And remember, wherever you go, you can't hide from God. Amen. He sees everything. God bless you now. Bye-bye.